Right, Ruth. So the reason for looking at Ruth is to talk about, uh, well, to talk about despair. I want to look at Naomi and Ruth, uh, especially in this first chapter, and, and think about it. Because, well, there are reasons to despair in life, and then um, we have to think about what to do about that. <clears throat> how to respond to that, because there are reasons. Uh, there are bad things that befall us and beset us, and we ought to think through it. But I think, too, that you've got to be sure that you keep the vision uh, in the right spot, that you know God is, is always there, that God is always with you, that he and his kingdom are the most important thing, and that, you know, that should... Uh, comfort us in that it's there and it's always there and that you know there are many even though there might be a lot of things that are transient or uh, passing because that is the way of the earth nonetheless god will always be there and he is always our friend and and we have his word and he answers our prayers he hears us and so don't you know I guess I'm looking for us not to despair, not to lose heart, not to lose sight of the goal. Which is not to minimize anybody's suffering, um, you know, whether my own or, or, or yours or whoever, whatever. Not saying that at all, just saying that we should hang on to the perspective. And Naomi is an example of how perspective can be lost. Um, that's why I wanted to look at the first chapter here. Um, it says in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of that man was Elimelech, the name of his wife, Naomi, and the two sons, Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and stayed there. In Moab, Elimelech, or Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. The two sons took Moabite wives. One was Orpah, the other was Ruth. They lived there about ten years because there had been a famine in Judah. <clears throat> And both Mahlon and Kilion died too. So the woman was left without her two sons and without her husband. And she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab because she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So the famine's over. You can go back to Israel. And this is the, uh, this is the stage that is set and if you look at Naomi, um, the word Naomi, I believe, is something like uh, joyful or spirited, uh, maybe happy or blessed. But um, if you look at Naomi, there was famine in Jerusalem or in Judah. And because there was famine, it got so bad they had to go and live in Moab, a foreign country, they were not supposed to be marrying people at Moab. You may recall that um, incident with Baal Peor that was recorded. They shouldn't have been marrying, and her sons took wives from there, which shows us that they didn't think they were going back, or they didn't think that they should wait. <clears throat> Did they think that famine was forever, and that Judah would never be inhabitable again. It was about 10 years they spent down there. Now, I understand putting your life on hold in some sense for 10 years is terrible, but that's, you know, that's famine. If you're going to leave Israel and go stay in Moab so you can live, well, that's, you know, you lived. That's 10 years. But... They go down to Moab and, and, you know, the husband dies there. 
<clears throat> away from his family, away from his home, you know, away from everything. And then the sons are marrying Moabites, as we know, but then they die too. It's not told, you know, how or why they died, just that they did. She lost everybody in some sense, and that everybody that went over with her is gone. She's the only Israelite left. She looks at it and sees that her husband is dead. Her sons were old enough to marry, and they did marry, but now her daughters were widows too. The three of them here. So you say, well, you know, she had to leave because of famine. That's bad. She had to leave everything. And then her husband died in this foreign land away from everybody. And her sons also came to nothing in this foreign land. She's got these foreigner daughters-in-law who are widows now. Does she have reason to be sad? Well, I think so. That is a very sad thing. Um, I do not pretend to know what it would be like to lose a mate. I can only contemplate that that would be a terrible thing, a terrible, painful thing. I am, I'm sure that she had reason to be sad, and um, we don't in any way diminish that. And to lose a child also, I've not done. Um, and I don't want to, but I assume that that is a terrible, painful thing. So she, in some sense, lost her homeland, lost her place. Uh, she is losing her, her, or has lost her uh, husband or sons. You know, these loved ones who were with her, who were kind of the reason she was there to begin with. So what do you do about that? How do you respond to something like that? You know, is it the Lord's fault? I don't think so. He allowed it to happen. Lots of things happen. And there are no guarantees or promises in this world, in this life. That's not his fault. But it says, <clears throat> the seventh verse of Ruth, chapter one. So she set out. From the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And she kissed them, and they wept up. Uh, lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we'll go with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back. Why will you go with me? Now you think about this for a minute. Can you imagine that, you know, you have uh, gone with your um family to another place where you nonetheless are servants of the Lord and your sons have married women who are not yet Christians and something terrible befalls them so that you're going to move back to your original place and these two widows they want to come with you can you imagine turning them away and saying go back to your pagan culture go back to your pagan religion Go back to your house and take on the traditions of your fathers when they want to be with you and attend church? Why would you do that? How does that make sense? Why would she do something like that? They said they wanted to go to Israel. That's good. She should encourage them to go to Israel. But no, what she says is, no, why would you stay with me? Do I have yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way. I too am old. 
uh, too old. I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and bear you sons, would you wait until they were fully grown? Would they? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it's exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So she thinks that it is the Lord that has struck her. That's not true. Uh, he has allowed things to happen, perhaps. But she's alive. But you see how she's arguing this, saying, well, no, no, I mean, you know, the, you, I'm not going to produce more husbands for you. You won't stay in my family unit. You see how Naomi is missing the spiritual implications of everything? She's missing it. There's something much more important than her earthly family and her earthly ties and their earthly family to be sure. She bids them go back to their homes and their gods instead of joining her in Israel. She's missing it because of her despair. She thinks God has gotten her. But that's not true. She's alive. It's bitter to me for your sake. She styles this as concern for the daughters-in-law, but really, I think we can see that this is actually just Naomi being sad for herself, thinking that she is a victim, that God has come to get her. And this is how despair happens. We get to thinking that, you know, we are alone, we are uncared for, um, forsaken by God, perhaps. Otherwise, why would these things have happened? And we should never think that way. Um, you know, feelings are valid, but the mind should know that that's not the God that we serve, and that's not what's happened. They lifted their voices and wept again, the 14th says, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Orpah said, kissed her goodbye, <laughs> and she did go back to Moab, but not Ruth. Ruth stayed there. She said, no way. Naomi said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. You see that? She knows that this means a life of idolatry for them, but she sends them back. How can she do that? Does she no longer believe in God because God let her down? Because she suffered? Because bad things happened to the people she loved? I mean, that's bad. Like I say, it's terrible. It's painful. I can only contemplate that. But you can't blame God. It's not God's fault. He didn't come to get you. and to send them on to idolatry. How could that ever be right? Don't you want everybody to be saved? Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and that's where I'll be buried too. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. <laughs> so for just a minute, I realized that people use that, these words of Ruth as mar marriage vows, and that's a reasonable thing. It's a very nice thought, but it's not what we're talking about. She's saying that she wants to be an Israelite. In some sense, she's spiritually marrying God. <laughs> and think about that. We've heard nothing from Ruth. The first thing she says is, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. Where you go, I will go. 
right? May the Lord do so to me and more too, if anything but death parts me from you. That's the first thing we hear from Ruth. I think about that. What a, what a great young woman. What a great shot in the arm she is. Super encouraging. Stalwart and faithful. She brings that vigor of youth, <laughs> the encouragement of it, to somebody who needs encouragement. No question Naomi needs encouragement. I don't want to, I'm not trying to beat Naomi up. I'm saying she's clearly down. She's so down that she is not thinking rationally in the spirit, sending people off to idolatrous homes. No. But not Ruth. Still, when Naomi saw she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Not, thank you, Ruth. I'm so glad that you want to serve God or thank you for being by my side or... No. Nope. She stopped talking to her. <laughs> That's interesting. It's going to take her a while to warm up, I think. And more than I think, it's what it tells us. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. So they leave Moab, they walk, walk the earth till they get to Bethlehem. And when they get to Bethlehem, the town is stirred because of them. The women said, is this Naomi? She's come back. For one thing, maybe she looks terrible. I don't know. <laughs> I think I would look terrible after that ordeal. They're saying, is this Naomi? So she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Ah, I have a footnote here, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter, which is like the waters of Meribah, the bitter waters. She said, do not call me pleasant, call me bitter. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me pleasant when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? In this way Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. That's how she came back. They said, is that Naomi? She said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Naomi, pleasant, Mara, bitter. I'm bitter now. Why? Because the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full. The Lord has brought me back empty. Uh, you know, at that point, maybe Ruth raises her hand. <laughs> uh, you know, you're not completely empty. <laughs> Naomi, <laughs> I, I'm here with you. I love you. I'm dedicated to you. Right? How could she come back and tell everybody I am bitter and I'm empty when Ruth is standing right there and she's so strong. It's so good and energetic. But that's just it. The despair makes you overlook all the blessings and all the good And there's no judgment in the text, and I would make no judgment either, about the men, the men who died in Naomi's family. It doesn't say. Were they bad? I don't... There's no indication that they were. There's no judgment in there, and that's because it's, it's not relevant. How they lived is how they lived. They're, they're done. It's over. It's Naomi's time. It's Ruth's time. You know, we are, we are here. <laughs> here we are. Maybe you didn't think we would get here. Uh, you know, I remember 30 years ago thinking I would never get to 48. <laughs> but here I am. And you say, 48? Oh, man, I didn't realize that. It is, the, it is really bad. <laughs> yeah. It's true. People are like, hey, you look great for a septuagenarian. Yeah, yeah, I do, but I'm 48.
you can't forget the blessings. See, Naomi forgot. She said, oh, God has been bitter to me. I've come back empty-handed. No, no, that's not true. You came back with Ruth. And she is awesome. She is strong. She is faithful. Look at what she said again. Where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I lodge. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. Where you die, I will be buried too. May the Lord do so to me and more too, if anything but death parts me from you. She is fulfilling her original marriage vow, if you will. When she married this woman's son, she took that woman as part of her family. And she's honoring that and says, it's going to be so until death. I will be faithful to this promise. That's wonderful. Ruth is fantastic. An excellent woman of good sense and of faith. Hard worker. That's what the rest of this text is telling us. Now, <clears throat> yeah, hmm. there's a lot that comes to pass because of this. In the end of the text in chapter 4 of Ruth, you can see. There's a fellow named Boaz, who is a relative, who has the means to redeem her. That is to say, in the law of Moses, a person is to marry on behalf of the deceased in order to raise up heirs and to raise a name um, for them. This is in the law. It's provided for in the law. Yeah, this is in the law. It's provided for in the law. We lost connection somehow. Sorry. I don't know what happened to that Zoom meeting. Um, and Boaz is a relative. Even though Elimelech is gone and the sons are gone, there is still a relative to whom the right falls, and he exercises that right. That's Boaz. And the ninth verse of Ruth 4, Boaz, the Redeemer, or I'm sorry, the Redeemer, that is the last remaining person in line before him, said, buy it for yourself. And Boaz, in the ninth verse, said to the elders and the people, you are witnesses this day. I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon. So Naomi owns these things because she's the last living person in that bloodline. And he is redeeming it from her, her husband's share, and the two sons too. Also, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. Your witnesses this day, and all the people at the gate, and the elders too, said, We are witnesses. This is formal, formalized. There was somebody left. There was somebody there who cared for them and who took them under his wing, who had the ability, and did so. And perhaps, when you read through the text and you see how that she worked for him and she won his heart, and he was not really 
of an age to marry her, he thought that she was much younger and would never like a fellow like him, but she did. She knew that she wanted to be part of Israel, and that was something, and he was faithful, and that was something. That was important to her. So he did this, and it's a great blessing to him, and it's a great blessing to her. And the people said in the 11th verse, May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. This is a wedding blessing that is spoken to them that you be like Rachel and Leah, that you be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore, because of the offspring Lord will, the Lord will give you by the young woman. So there will be offspring for the deceased. This will perpetuate the name. It fulfills the law. It blesses each of them. And Boaz took Ruth, who became his wife. He went into her, and the Lord gave her conception. She bore a son. Then we zoom out to Naomi. The women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, but may, and his, may his name be renowned in Israel. He will be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age, because your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. So she came and said, God has been bitter and left me empty. But what, what they said was, the Lord has not left you this day without a Redeemer. There is salvation. There is deliverance. God has not overlooked your suffering. And this faithful woman is worth more than seven sons. <laughs> That's true. Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. <laughs> she never thought that would happen. <laughs> she never thought that would happen, but it did. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name. A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, who is the father of David. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amenadab. Amenadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Or Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. But Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. What's the meaning of this? Well, the meaning of this is Naomi and Ruth are now in the royal lineage. Naomi. Yeah, we got, what do we have? We have Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David. Boaz is David's great uh, grandfather, right? His grandfather was Obed. His father was Jesse. Boaz is David's great-grandfather. And Ruth, <laughs> his great-grandmother. And in the end, you know, we look over in Matthew chapter 1 as we ought to do after finishing Luke, or I'm sorry, um, Ruth chapter 4 because Matthew makes sure that you understand this Matthew 1 verses 2 through 5 Abraham was the father of Isaac Isaac 
the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. That's what you just read in Ruth 4. Perez, father of Hezron, Hezron, father of Ram, Ram, father of Ammonadab, Ammonadab, father of Nashon, Nashon, father of Salmon, Salmon, father of Boaz by Rahab. That's interesting. Rahab, yes, Rahab, in Joshua 6 and 7. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. Obed, father of Jesse, Jesse, father of David the king. Which is to say, she's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Ruth is the mother of Jesus Christ, in a sense. She's an ancestor. So Naomi despaired, didn't she? She thought everything was lost and she was empty-handed, but that is not true. It certainly was terrible what happened, but there is still life and there is still hope and there is still a redeemer and there is still good to do and that can be done. She lost sight of the good that Ruth was by her side and lost sight of the good that was possible by God and by his people. And, you know, she would have sent Ruth away, who is in the lineage of our Lord because of that despair. But despair did not win, thankfully. Hope won, persistence and faith, these things won. And because of that, you and I have great blessings. So we all owe her a debt. And we all have to remember that despair can destroy much good. We must not give in to it. Uh, yeah, there's sadness. And being sad is a thing. But do not allow it to rule your life. Do not allow it to set the course for the rest of your life. To stay in a state where you think that God has dealt bitterly with you and it's your job to be bitter and tell everybody how bitter you are when they talk to you. No. No. You have life. You have breath. You have a God whom you serve who is very much alive. And a salvation in your heart that is very much precious to every soul who is around you. They need to hear that from you. All right. I think that's pretty cool. Ruth is pretty cool. And Naomi did come around. Because <laughs> there is not a grandmother in here or anywhere else who's going to tell you that having the baby sit on your lap and feeding him <laughs> is not really cool. You love that. You know Naomi came around and said, all right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, this is pretty good. <laughs> Eventually. So hold out in faith. Trust in the Lord. Today, are you a child of God, a Christian? Put your trust in him. There are reasons to despair in life. I mean, there's lots of things that seem like lost causes. What is broken cannot be repaired. What is crooked cannot be straightened. The uh, wisdom of God says that, and it's true. There is corruption in the world, and it can't be stopped. It's, it's never going to stop. But you can live right. And people who come into contact with you can live right, too, when they bring themselves into subjection to God's teaching. That's the hope that we have in this world as we reach others, as we talk to others about the faith. 
Today, if you are not a Christian, become a Christian so that you might have salvation, so you might have forgiveness, so you might have a hope and a reason to give hope, despite perhaps the loss of many very important things to you. We are ready to help you with that. We have water prepared that you might be baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins. Are you a Christian who has not lived right? Repent, make things right with God. Pray God for forgiveness in the heart, but let us pray for you too, that you might be strengthened and, and us too, to stand by your side, to hold each other's hands up, to go forward in this world. The congregation is very important. You know, the people here are the best people in the whole city. Uh, and I'd say that, they're, they're, you know, you all are among the finest people on the earth. The Lord said, the kings of the earth bring their glory into it. And that's how he sees us. Those who obey the gospel are the kings of the earth. The salt, you know, we do, even if the world mistreats us, and even if, of course, Satan mistreats us and besets us with terrible things and losses, we still love one another in the faith. And I hope that that is something that we can do a good job, I guess, of making clear to one another that we do care about each other and we do pray for each other in earnestness. So if you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, please let that need be known now by coming to the front while together we sing the song that has been selected. 